So we are continuing our series through the book of Revelation, and we have just heard Revelation chapter 19 read to us. It began with heaven rejoicing over the destruction of Babylon, which we looked at last week. The passage went on to tell us about a rider on a white horse who is Jesus Christ himself returning to rule the nations. The beast and the false prophet were thrown into hell called the lake of fire and the armies who have gathered to fight against Christ were killed by the sword that proceeds from Jesus' mouth. I want to focus in this message on the description of Jesus in verses 11 to 16. We will start with verse 11 of Revelation 19 which said, Then I saw heaven opened and there was a white horse. Its rider is called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. So Jesus there is depicted as riding a white horse. And this is in contrast to the donkey that he rode on in his first coming when he entered Jerusalem. The donkey is for peace, but the horse is for war. And Jesus is called faithful and true. He is faithful to keep his promises. He cannot lie. He said that he would return. Now he is returning. And it says in righteousness he judges and makes war. When we pray, your kingdom come, I wonder how you think it will come. It will come by war. The kingdoms of this world will not voluntarily hand over their keys to Jesus. He will take them by force. It will be war. But what will replace the current order is a kingdom of righteousness and of justice and of peace. In righteousness he makes war. In Psalm 96 verses 12 to 13 it says, Let the field exult and everything in it. Then shall all the trees of the forest sing for joy before the Lord. For he is coming, for he is coming to judge the earth. He will judge the world with righteousness and the peoples with his truth. And then in Jeremiah 23, verse 5, it says, The days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will raise up for David a righteous branch, and that branch is Jesus. And he shall reign as king and deal wisely, and shall execute justice and righteousness in the land. Now coming back to our passage in verse 12, it said, His eyes are like a flame of fire, and on his head are many diadems, and he has a name in scribes that no one knows but himself. So firstly, it says his eyes are like a flame of fire. And Jesus is able to judge righteously because his vision penetrates our souls. He knows what is really going on within us. And I'm glad that there is no friend like Jesus. No one can understand you like him. He can see right into your soul and everything that goes on in it. There's a proverb that says, the spirit of a man is the candle of the Lord. And by it he searches the innermost parts. He's able to see what's going on within us. And on his head it says, are many diadems, not just one. Jesus is the true king. There is no king like him. He said in Matthew 28 verse 18, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. No one else can say that. All authority, not only on earth but in heaven, is given to this king. Now back at verse 12 of Revelation 19 it said, And he has a name inscribed that no one knows but himself. Seeing as no one knows it, it's pointless us trying to guess what that name is. 
But earlier in Revelation, Jesus said the following to the church in Philadelphia in Revelation 3 verse 12. He said, if you conquer, I will make you a pillar in the temple of my God, you will never go out of it. I will write on you the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem that comes down from my God out of heaven, and my own new name. And so the fact that Jesus will write his own new name on the heads of those who overcome, those who conquer, those who are faithful till the end, this suggests that those who overcome will know Jesus on a level that they cannot imagine. It's a token of intimacy. His new name, which no one knows, will be written on their head. And we will know him. And it continues in verse 13 of our passage. He is clothed in a robe dipped in blood. And his name is called the Word of God. So he is clothed in a robe dipped with blood. And this may refer to his own blood. If so, it reminds us of his great love for the world that he now comes to judge. He died so that this world could be saved. And so he is the only one worthy to bring this age to a close. But another view is that that blood is the blood of those he kills when he returns. And we don't want to have a too nice image of Jesus. Many people have an image of Jesus that is such that he wouldn't hurt a fly. But that's not the Jesus of the Bible. Jesus is brutal. And we must remember that. He's not only gentle and nice, he is severe as well. Somebody once said that if your image of Jesus is that he would never destroy the world with a flood, your image of Jesus is wrong, because he did. And there's another flood coming, the Bible tells us, not a flood of water, but of fire that will destroy the whole universe. Jesus will do that. He both loves us and he's also our judge. And you cannot have someone who is only nice and not severe. That's no way to run the world. How would you feel if the most wicked of people, the Hitlers, the abusers, the most awful people you could think of, how would you feel if there was no justice for them? That wouldn't be right. They must be judged, and Jesus will do that. And part of the Gospel, and this is in the book of Acts, is this. When Peter was preaching on one occasion, or, yeah, it was Peter, he said that Jesus told us to tell the world that he is the one who will judge the world. That's part of the Gospel. Letting people know that Jesus is the man that God has chosen to judge the world. And Jesus said this, You have that which will judge you on that day, even my word which I have spoken to you. In other words, it won't, we won't be able to say, but I felt this or I feel that. There's an objective testimony we could look to to determine how we will be judged, and that's Jesus' words. And Jesus said this, he said, every idle word that humans will speak, they will have to give an account for on the day of judgment. And by their words they will be justified, and by their words they will be condemned. Every idle word you have spoken, you will have to give an account for. What would happen? How would you feel if right now every word you've ever spoken to anyone were replayed for all of us to hear? From the start of your life till the end, till now. Would it be okay? Would you survive the day of judgment? And so thank God he gives us the opportunity to repent. 
But I want to say to you, be very careful with your words. Even the idle words, he says, we will give an account for. Now then, it also says that Jesus, his name is called the Word of God. How did God create the world? He said, let there be light. And light was. He created by speaking. And Jesus is called the Word of God because he is the agent through whom God created all things. He is the logic of everything. Interestingly, the word for word in Greek is logos. Logos, from which we get the English word logic. And Jesus is the reason why behind everything. It's his wisdom that made everything. And so it says in John 1, 1 to 3, in the beginning was the word, the logos, and the word was with God, and the word was God. Now, uh, what on earth does that mean? This is the very first verse of John's Gospel, and already it's slightly confusing. Before he's even warmed up, he already starts with a mystery. This word was with God, and the word was God. How on earth can that be? Well, I'll give you a little analogy that might help. Let's imagine that you have a glass of water, and then you put some ice cubes in the water. You could say, in the glass are the ice cubes. The ice cubes are with the water, and the ice cubes are water. Now when you get that, you begin to understand what's going on here. Because in the Greek, the word for God, first, I mean, I'll read it to you a bit more literally, not completely literally, but a bit more literally as it reads in the Greek. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with the God, and the word was God. Now you'll notice that the second occurrence of God had the word the behind, before it. And in Greek, that's the definite article. It's basically similar to the English word the. It's pointing at something and saying that thing. Now, in the, the word was with the God, and the word was God. Now, that second occurrence of God has no definite article before it. And when it's used in this way, what that means is that the word God is descriptive of the word. It's much like when the Bible says God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. The word light, having no definite article before it, is descriptive of God. God is light. In the same way, God here is descriptive of the Word. Jesus, in other words, he's saying this, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was everything that God was. His very essence is God. And this is why Jesus said, He who has seen me has seen the Father. How do you describe Jesus? God. That's his essence, that's his description, that's who he is. One with God. And so, it continues, he was in the beginning with God, all things came into being through him, and without him not one thing came into being. Nothing exists that Jesus didn't create, he is the word by whom God created all things. Now, in the next verse of our passage, in verse 14, it says this, And the armies of heaven, wearing fine linen, white and pure, were following him on white horses. Now, who are these armies? In Matthew 16, 27, Jesus said, For the Son of Man is to come with his angels in the glory of his Father, and then he will repay everyone for what has been done. So he's coming with the angels. In other words, Jesus is not coming alone. He's coming with his angels, and so what I want us to see here is this. What we are seeing in the book of Revelation 
is that when Jesus returns, it is a true invasion of earth by heaven. Much like what Putin is trying to do unsuccessfully in Ukraine. His, his invasion hasn't quite worked. But this invasion that we are looking at here will work. It is heaven invading earth and taking over. It is an invasion. Some wonder about aliens. Are there any aliens? Will there be a, an alien invasion? Well, yes, there will be. It's the heavenly aliens. Not like E.T. They look a lot better than him. But it is a heavenly invasion of earth. And he doesn't just come to pat people on the back. It continues in verse 15. From his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations and he will rule them with a rod of iron. He will tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God the Almighty. Now from his mouth comes a sharp sword, it says, with which he will strike down the nations. A very strange image. But what it simply implies is that in order to strike the nations, he only needs to speak. The sword comes out of his mouth. He speaks and it's done. And we saw that in Jesus' earthly ministry. He, Just say the word and my servant will be healed, said someone to Jesus. And that's what happened. Jesus just needs to speak and it's done. Just say the word. And so he simply needs to speak here and he is able to instantly strike the nations. It says he will rule the nations with a rod of iron. And so when Jesus comes, the angels won't come to organize a general election to see if the earth will vote for Jesus. Jesus will rule with a rod of iron. In other words, it will be by force. There will be no choice. It will be enforced. And democracy is not the best form of government. The best form of government is to be ruled by a good and perfect king who lives forever. Now you think about that. A good and perfect king who lives forever. You see, there's not a new leader every four years. And so you can never get anything done, long term. And you have to make promises that will appeal to the electorate. You can't think too long term. Because people have problems that need dealing with now. But what a perfect form of government is, is a good and perfect king who lives forever. But the only king that matches that description is Jesus. And so there will be no perfect form of government until he comes. And this is why we are to look forward and even hasten his return. Now, our passage then says that Jesus will tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God the Almighty. And this is a quotation from Isaiah 63, verse 3, in which God says that he has trodden the winepress alone. And this is one of the numerous times that the book of Revelation is not shy about equating Jesus with the Almighty God. He did that in the first few chapters, and it's doing it again here. Jesus is God Almighty. He is the one who treads the winepress. And Jesus, in other words, when it says he will tread the winepress of God's wrath, he will unleash God's wrath when he returns. Can you understand why Jesus delays his coming? When he comes, it will not be a pretty scene. Well, there will be some parts that are pretty, like when you rise to meet him in the air with a glorious new body. I've wondered about burial versus being cremated. Um, 
I, part of my mind wants to be cremated. And the reason why, and but, but it, I don't leave such decisions to me because it's not me that has to do the cremation. But does just indulge me for a moment. Part of my mind likes the idea of being cremated for the very spiritual reason that when we are resurrected, I just think it will look really cool, my ashes coming from all over the place. <laughs> and you know, this new body appearing, I just think that would be, you know, a bit special. So, um, but, so that will be pretty. All right? There will be lovely parts of, you know, lo the whole thing is good, don't get me wrong, but what I'm trying to say is that there are bits that are not so pleasant when Jesus returns. He will unleash God's wrath. And it is this wrath that Jesus unleashes when he returns that Paul referred to in his letter to the Thessalonians in 1 Thessalonians 1, verses 9 to 10. It says, You turned to God from idols to serve a living and true God and to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who rescues us from the wrath that is coming. And the way we will be rescued from that wrath that Jesus will unleash when he returns is we will rise to meet him in the air. And it says in 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 to 17, For the Lord himself will descend from heaven, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up in the clouds together with them to meet the Lord in the air, and so we will be with the Lord forever. And so, let me read to you a bit more about this wrath that Paul mentioned. And I'll read it to you from 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. It won't be on the screen. But I just want to give you an idea of what will happen when Jesus returns. So it says in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 5 and onward, it says, This is the evidence of the righteous judgment of God and is intended to make you worthy of the kingdom of God for which you are also suffering. Now watch this closely. For it is indeed just of God to repay with affliction those who afflict you and to give relief to the afflicted as well as to us when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire inflicting vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. These will suffer the punishment of eternal destruction, separated from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his might when he comes to be glorified by his saints and to be marveled at on the day among all who have believed because our testimony to you was believed. And so Paul there describes what will happen when Jesus comes back. It says, in flaming fire, he will inflict vengeance on those who do not know God. Everyone say, no God. No God. And then it says, and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. Now that's an interesting phrase, on those who do not know God. What on earth does that mean? When we think of knowing God, and this is true, we think of a relationship with Him. But knowing God in Scripture is both vertical and horizontal. It's not only vertical. In other words, it's not only about you and God, it's about the way you treat others. And in the book of Jeremiah, one of the themes, and I didn't come prepared to mention this, but if you want to find it, you just have to read the whole book of Jeremiah. But one or if for a shortcut, there is a video on our YouTube channel that goes through the book of Jeremiah, and um, you can find what I'm about to say um, in that video with the specific reference. But one of the themes in Jeremiah is the concept of knowing God. But in the book of Jeremiah, it defines what it means to know him. And it talks about treating others right, and then says, what is this not knowing God? In other words, to know God is to know his character and to live that out in this world. We are walking with him and treating others right 
because we know God and we know what he is like. But Paul says that those who don't know God, those who don't know his true character, those who therefore mistreat others and don't represent God in the way they behave, Jesus will destroy them when he returns in flaming fire he will inflict vengeance on them and they will be punished with everlasting destruction and notice he also said not only those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus everyone say obey Amen. now notice he didn't say those who do not believe and that's obviously very important. He said those who do not obey. Actions speak louder than words. The gospel is not only something to be believed, but something to be obeyed. Why? Because the gospel, as I said, includes the fact that Jesus is the one whom God has appointed to judge the world. And if you really believe that, it will change the way you behave. The gospel is to be obeyed. The message of repentance is to be obeyed. And every Christian must ask themselves this, have I really repented? How close to sin am I living? Am I flirting with sin? In other words, am I trying to get as close as is permissible? Or have I truly renounced sin and want nothing to do with it? I want to get as far away from it as possible. We must obey the gospel. So, when Jesus comes, there will be great wrath unleashed on the earth. And in his teaching, Jesus likened his return to the flood that swept the people away in the days of Noah. And he said in Matthew 24, 37 to 42, he said, For as the days of Noah were, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. For as in those days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day Noah entered the ark. And they knew nothing until the flood came and swept them all away. So too will be the coming of the Son of Man. Then two will be in the field, one will be taken and one will be left. The woman will be grinding meal together, one will be taken and one will be left. Keep awake, therefore, for you do not know on what day your Lord is coming. Now Noah entering the ark corresponds to us meeting the Lord in the air at his return. The flood that swept them away corresponds to the wrath that Jesus will unleash when he returns. As for one being taken and the other being left, there are two ways this may, may be understood. It could refer to the following. One being taken and the other left could refer to the fact that when Jesus comes, we will be taken to meet him in the air, whilst those who disobey the gospel will be left behind to experience Christ's wrath. But we can also read it the other way around, and some interpret it this way, that the one being taken refers to one being taken in judgment, and the other is left to stand before the Lord. So that's another way of reading it, but whichever way one reads it, it's the same thing, you've got to be ready. <laughs> God's wrath will be unleashed on that day, and we want to be those who enter the ark and are not destroyed by that wrath. Now finally, we read the following about Jesus in Revelation 19.16. It says, On his robe and on his thigh he has a name inscribed, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Jesus is the only legitimate heir of this world. He is the only legitimate ruler. In Hebrews 1, verse 2, it says, But in these last days, God has spoken to us by a son, 
whom he appointed heir of all things. Jesus is the one who has been appointed to inherit everything. And then in Colossians 1.15, he's therefore called the firstborn of all creation. And as the firstborn, he has the right to inherit the estate. And the day is coming when Jesus will come and take what's his. That's all he's doing. Simply taking what belongs to him. And so we want to make sure that we are in Christ. And it's only because we are in him that we will reign with him when he comes and share his inheritance. But those who reject him, well, they will suffer his wrath on that day. So, Jesus will return, but what happens next? Well, God willing, we will find out next week when we read Revelation chapter 20. But let me summarize this message. First of all, the day is coming when heaven will invade earth. Jesus will rule this earth by force. Now, before I continue there, I want you to notice something. When Jesus returns, he has enemies that he has to destroy. You notice that? Have you ever heard this talk of the great end time revival? Have you heard of that before? No. Wherever did you read of such a thing in the Bible? My Bible tells me that narrow is the way few there be who go on that path and that Jesus will have a whole heap of enemies to destroy when he returns. It says nothing about there being a great end time revival. It's always good to check what you hear against the Bible. And in this church, anything I say, you can always come and ask me, where is that in the Bible? And if I can't show it to you, don't believe it. Or I might say, I'll come back to you if I can't remember the reference off the top of my head. But if I never do come back to you, don't believe it until you find it in the Bible. All of us have traditions we have inherited. Whether we are aware of it or not, we all have traditions and biases that we bring to Scripture. And so, this is why what I say is, I think it's impossible to read the Bible without bias. The best you can do is try to be aware of your biases as you read it so that you can take that into consideration. Let me give you a quick example. You cannot get past the second verse of the whole of Genesis, the second verse in the Bible, without some form of bias. The first verse says, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Straightforward enough. But then it goes on to say, in either verse 2 or 3, it says that the Spirit of God moved on the surface of the deep. Okay? Now what's the problem there? You go and read a Jewish Bible, and it will say, and it's not the Spirit of God, but a wind from God moved over the surface of the deep. Which is right. If we read it with a Christian bias, we will say the Spirit of God. But if you're not coming from that perspective, you might think a wind from God. Because in Hebrew, the word ruach can mean wind or spirit. And so we all bring biases to the text. And we have to be aware of what biases we are bringing to make sure we truly are reading the thing objectively as we ought to with the help of the Holy Spirit as we do so. So, the day is coming when heaven will invade earth, Jesus will rule by force and his kingdom will be one of righteousness, of justice and of peace. We who are saved will be delivered from God's wrath when Jesus comes. We will rise to meet him in the air with new glorified bodies and will forever be 
with the Lord. I don't know about you, but I'm looking forward to that new glorified body where we will never experience pain, suffering, or anything like that again, and we will be like Jesus.